thank you for being here on such a beautiful day. We should do this outside in the outdoor classroom. You know, I think you could all just, that wouldn't show up very well in the outdoor classroom behind Centennial Hall. Um, Brian Burnett, Vice Chancellor for Administration Finance, and today um, Gary's going to do the majority of this presentation. Welcome, Chancellor. I didn't know if you were going to kick it off or we should expect to. Okay. Um, just wanted to share with you our master plan, our newest version of the campus facilities master plan that's been quite a few months in the works, um, ably held by, uh, led by Gary and with a lot of participation from folks in our community, from folks in our neighborhood, um, folks on the campus, and, and so we're excited to share this with you today. I will tell you it's still draft. It has been approved by the Board of Regents at its September meeting in Boulder. But it has not been scheduled, and it will be scheduled in the December meeting of the Commission on Higher Education. And just so you know, you have to have an active master plan or a facilities master plan to be able to ask for any buildings of any source of funding. So, and these are good for 10 years. And our last one we did was in December of 2006. So we did it a little bit earlier. That one wouldn't have expired till 2016. But so much has changed on the campus. So many things have changed since 2006, including acquisition of properties towards um, the University Hall property to the east part of the campus, changes across the street on, on North Nevada with the urban renewal zone. We felt like it was time to update the master plan sooner than the 10-year window, and you're allowed to do that. So this master plan, once it's approved by the commission, and it's just that, a plan. It can be adjusted, other things can happen, but this will be good from 2012 through 2022. So um, anyway, unless we decide to revise it sooner again, like we did this time. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gary, and um, we are taping this so that it can be broadcast and shared with others who couldn't be here today. So we're going to try and stay close to the mic here, um, and I'm going to assist Gary, but this, uh, Gary knows this inside and out, and I'm really proud to introduce uh, Executive Director Gary Reynolds of our Facilities uh, Department to bring you the master plan. Gary? Well, I'm very excited about this master plan. I've had the opportunity through the three schools I've worked at to be involved with other master plans. And sometimes you have to do a lot of compromising to get where you want to be. I think in this master plan you're going to find that um, we were able to work through many issues and that what we brought forth, I like a phrase that Air St. Gross uh, brought forward as part of this process the responsible capacity of the land. I think that really summarizes the gist of what you're, I'm going to share with you this afternoon. So I've got a bunch of slides. Some of them I'll go through very quickly. I'll be glad to uh, visit afterwards if you have any questions. And if you have something that pops in your head as we're going, please uh, raise your hand, just like in class. All right, so. So what was the purpose of the plan? One is we are a growing campus. I think we all have seen the strain of filled classrooms, parking lots being filled, etc. And we need to make sure that as we're accommodating that growth, we're doing it in a rational way. Um, we needed to evaluate uh, the responsible capacity of the land. We have roughly 455 acres, of which about 80 or 90 up here on the core campus, as we call it. But as you go down, uh, Austin Bluffs and wrap around to the north on North Nevada, there's 455 acres. But me, only about half of that acreage is really buildable because it goes up onto the bluff or it's got deep arroyos that we want to stay out of. Um, certain areas, the soils are even worse than we have here on the campus and so it's difficult to build. So in reality, maybe only half of that is actually buildable. Um, we wanted to make sure that as the area across the street, University Village, Colorado, developed that we are integrating with that properly. Uh, as you know, the university invested in the pedestrian underpass. Uh, we also worked with the city on undergrounding the high voltage electric lines along there as part of that process. So uh, we've been able to try to make sure that what we're doing on our side of the street will fit in with what's going on on the other side of the street. And then lastly, I think one of the real reasons for redoing the master plan early was the need to have the university redo its strategic plan. And as you know, the strategic plan um, involves many more things than just the physical aspects of the campus. 
and but we wanted to make sure that the physical development and master plan met where the strategic plan was taking the university. So it was very good timing in that respect, and you'll see a number of places in this presentation where we've integrated those things. Um, it was a very involved process. We started this uh, about 15 months ago, and uh, a master planning team was created. It had over 30 people on it, consisting of university people, the university administrators, faculty, students, but also outside of the university community. We had tra city traffic, city planning, I invited the facilities person from District 11 who has experience in this area to participate. Uh, we had both neighborhoods, the Craigmore Village neighborhood uh, the, and the Craigmore neighborhood and the Eagle Rock neighborhood were invited as well, where I had representatives on this committee. So had very, very broad representation uh, on the committee. Uh, the design review board, some of you may know that the University of Colorado has a design review board and we ran this through that process uh, with them several times so that they understood what we were doing and put their stamp of approval on it. And I'm pleased to say they unanimously approved it as well. We're very pleased with the direction we had taken the, the plan. We had a large number of focus groups on campus. Some of them um, were very small smoke focus groups, some of them a little larger. Uh, we had individual meetings with the chancellor and the vice chancellors. The Air St. Gross sat down with them and got their input. We met with business uh, owners across the street to get their sense of what, what they thought, uh, the neighborhoods, et cetera. Uh, we had several public forums. Um, I could summarize the, concept, uh, the discussions in the public forums with one word, parking, uh, because the public from the neighborhoods uh, were very concerned about that. And I'm pleased to say you know, we're moving forward with addressing some of that with a new parking garage I'll talk about in a second in a little bit. Uh, we had an open house workshop, which was kind of fun, where we brought people in. And we had huge maps all to scale, and people could play around and push little pieces around and kind of think about how a campus may lay out with the constraints that we had. And then the leadership team also. I've done several presentations to the leadership team and gotten their input. So the campus setting. The first thing you do when you're doing a master plan is understand what you have so you know where you're going from. And one of the things that we have going for us, we're the only four-year institution with a view, a uh, public institution with a view of Pulp, uh, uh, Pikes Peak and Pulpit Rock. So we want to honor that, and many of the buildings we've done on campus do do that, and we want to make sure that we recognize and honor that as we move forward. Uh, this shows you the outline of the land. So um, I don't, does this have a laser on it? Well, I will step out here and play down the light. Um, so our main core campus is down here. This is where we all think of the East Campus with University Hall way down in the far right corner. And then coming down Austin Bluffs and North Nevada, this is the uh, Four Diamonds area. The Eagle Rock community in the middle. This is uh, the Hell Art Center up in the far right with Pulpit Rock up at the top. And so that's the boundaries of the land up here on the core campus. We do own a little piece of ground south of town where the Expo Center has been developed. One of the things we wanted to take a look at, well, what do we have in terms of buildings and square footage and how is it allocated? This graph is in assignable square feet. What that means is you look at a room and you look at the inside of the walls and you say, that's how many square feet I have. It doesn't include the hallways and the mechanical rooms and the restrooms. And they took a look at this graph, and, and the upper part is mostly the academic spaces and the reds and the purples. In the middle, the blues and the greens and purples is the social spaces. And lo and behold, they determined that we were short of office spaces, which isn't surprising. Um, actually, the top bar represents classroom spaces, and we're not doing too bad. We exceed the CCHE guidelines for utilization of our classrooms. And, um, and we actually have some room to squeeze out into those a little bit more. As you know, parking lot's fuller on Fridays now, um, due to leadership's uh, work there to move some classes to Fridays. And so, and then we have weekend university going on now and things like that. So classrooms are starting to get squeezed, but a little room there to grow. But offices, uh, academic offices and um, staff offices, definitely a shortfall as we've added the staff to meet the growing enrollment. Social spaces, it shouldn't surprise you, were very short. 
we are basically started out as a commuter campus and there was no need for recreation centers and gyms and recreation fields. Students came to class, they, their, uh, the demographic was a working student and they went home or went back to work afterwards. Well, as we move towards a residential university, we need to start to provide those things and you've seen the rec center, uh, the, the lawn next to Osborne Center and the parking garage that we're going to build is going to have a recreation field on top of it. Um, so we're starting to um, try to address some of those. But we have shortfalls. The clubs, our student clubs, are squeezed into the Roar office area. They could use more space, storage space, and meeting space for themselves. So it shouldn't surprise us that we see shortfalls in the social area. Uh, down below, uh, we talk about a resident life area and the number of beds. And there's no real guidelines on beds. It's more or less what is the desire of the university. Right now, we're slightly under 10% of the student population lives on campus. Um, to give you a reference, Boulder, CSU are in the 22, 23% uh, number of beds of students living on campus. And you're gonna see in the master plan that to move us towards a critical mass of students living on campus so that we have that uh, critical mass of students to participate in clubs in the evenings and be around on the weekends and participate in intramural sports and those kinds of things, that we're gonna try to move that up. So uh, a little bit of the space. This is our campus. This is the north end. And what we're showing here is we're highlighting the area and the arroyos that come down through um, our land. And these, there's three major arroyos. This is Austin Bluffs coming up to the main campus here. This is North Nevada along here. The elevation change is something like 160 feet from North Nevada up to the Alpine Apartments. And, that's, and if you ever try to ride a bike or walk up the sidewalk along Austin Bluffs, you know that can be pretty darn steep. But in reality, if you see this red line on the graph, that kind of angles across the land, you can keep that to a reasonable 5% slope, which is kind of the, the maximum for a bicycle um, walking. So if we lay this out properly in connecting the campus, we can accommodate the, this, these steep hills. Or we could put in a gondola and just ride up the hill. <laughs> a number of people have suggested. Yeah, Mark is doing. Um, this gives you a little sense of the geology and some of the ground we work on. Um, there's a thing called expansive soils. We happen to be sitting right on top of that. What that means is when the ground gets wet, it expands. And then if there's a building sitting there, it moves the building. So we have to deal with those issues. And in some places, it's worse than others. So it's good to understand the hydrology. I mentioned the arroyos earlier. Uh, we want to respect those, um, both from a 100-year and 500-year flood standpoint to make sure we understand the, how the water moves through our campus. Um, native plant communities. It, it's interesting enough, just the slight elevation change from North Nevada and Austin Bluffs Corner up to the top of Pulpit Rock, there is quite a change in climate that drives the native plant changes along the way. Not as dramatic as Pikes Peak if you've ever driven that road, but there is a dramatic impact of climate along here. Cultural resources. This is something I learned when I got here. This area was a summer campground, North Nevada area, for Native Americans for literally thousands of years. And if you go out and walk around, you can find artifacts of their work in their summer camps. And in fact, this large purple area over here is an area that has a number of artifacts in it that our anthropology department uses for classes and training. So we would like to integrate that into the master plan and make it an educational experience as you walk by that or <coughs> travel by that area. Also, uh, Rocky Lindsay has drilled down in that area, 11 to 12 feet down, and found artifacts down in the ground. And that area is a sand dune, and sand is blown in from Arizona and New Mexico, just like the Sand Dunes National Park, covering up these artifacts over thousands and thousands of years. So it's a very interesting piece of ground that we're, we have. So you take all these constraints into consideration 
And basically the green area is probably where we don't want to build. And so you can see the amount of land that's left that we would uh, potentially look at for our infrastructure and for our buildings. This is where we integrated with the strategic plan. And the strategic plan says by 2020, we want to be a campus of roughly 11,000 undergraduate students and 2,500 graduate students. So we're looking at accommodating that number of students eight years from now. And so you take a look and you can see the, the, the rate of growth of the graph till about the mid-2000s. And then all of a sudden you can see that steep growth in the last four or five years. And if you extrapolate that out, that shows you kind of where we're headed, at least hopefully. Right, Chancellor? Um, if you take a look at that graph then and translate that into CCAT guidelines and how many square feet you should have of all this different kind of space that I talked about earlier, you can see the growth there. And we would be aiming for going from roughly our uh, 1.4 million gross square feet up to 2.2, 2.26 million gross square feet to accommodate this growth. And that would be across the spectrum of labs, classrooms, offices, and social space. Um, one of the questions that we were asked as part of this process is what, how does online classes affect us? I mean, a lot of students are taking online courses. Uh, at the time we did the snapshot with Robin, she told us 7% of the credit hours were being given online. And in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking online means some student in La Junta is getting on their computer and taking a class. In reality, it's a student who walks over to Dwyer in the morning, walks back to the residence hall in the afternoon and takes an online course. So they're actually physically here. And we don't really understand that mix yet, but we, we need to understand that mix because the students that are here taking online still want the social functions going on on the campus and those spaces that we would provide for them. Another interesting study that we did was, well, what if we doubled the percent of online courses over the strategic plan time frame to 15%. That would only impact a building of around 25,000 square feet. And if you take it all the way out to the full build out, maybe 50,000 square feet. So in adding 3.8 million square feet over the total master plan, it only says you maybe only could reduce the amount you need by 50,000 by 50, square feet. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, to give you a reference there, Osborne Center is 150,000 square feet, so it would be a third of the size of that building. Um, Centennial Hall is around 72,000 square feet. Gary, if I can just say one thing sure. there. As well, working with the faculty and the deans, the other thing about online development is most of our online classes today, and at least in the foreseeable future, are taught by faculty who have an office, meaning they're doing online as an overload or an additional section that they're doing. So it isn't, just because you're adding online courses doesn't mean we don't need faculty offices for the other on-campus classes they're teaching. Um, it would be a big departure, quite frankly, for this campus to um, hire faculty for just teaching online and have no connection to the campus whatsoever. And we don't have that today. And when we talked with the deans about it in this process, that was something that they were pretty skeptical about doing, that if we're gonna put classes online, we wanted it to be UCCS faculty that had offices here. So as we did this analysis, it wasn't just about whether online would obviate the need for classes, it was also looking at faculty offices as well. Good point, Brian. thank you. Um, and then we took a look at classroom utilization. So the model I'm going to share with you is based on CCHE guidelines and how many square we feet we should build and how many students we can accommodate. But we could accommodate more if we utilize our classrooms even to a tighter schedule. Um, and that means you know more, less, more classes from 8 to 10 and 2 to 5 and um, also more weekend classes. So this graph shows you, you know, a 30 hour week, that's the 13,000, but if you went to 40 hour week, that means classes are, are you, they've got somebody in that classroom 40 hours a week, then you could go up to 17.5, so you can see the additional accommodation there. I talked earlier about um, the number of beds on campus, and this is a graph that shows that if we wanted to move to 18% of our students living on campus, 
Uh, then 24, we would need to move up to 2,400 beds. We have 900 now. We're adding another 192 in the construction you see going on. And we would need to add some additional beds if we wanted to move up to this 18% range. And we're doing a feasibility study right now to look at how we might add more beds. And you'll see in the master plan where they potentially could go. So this is the interesting graph. If you start out with our fall count of 9321 in, in 2011, and then you move out to 2020 and 13,000 students, you can see the total gross square feet would go from the 1.4 to the 2.26. And if we were to build out to this responsible capacity of the land, remember that's not, we're not covering every square foot, the responsible capacity of the land, we're looking at somewhere between 20 and 25,000 students, and that's at the CCHE guidelines of space. If we exceed that, then we could move beyond the 22, 23,000 students to something above 25,000 to 30, potentially. And then this master plan also does not include Eagle Rock. And at some point, I would suggest that the university would end up buying out Eagle Rock, opening up a, not more, a lot more land for us, which allow us to grow there as well. Uh, we also took a look at housing and we took a look at parking as well. So let's get into the master plan. So this was taken out of the strategic plan that the master plan should provide a responsible campus stewardship that minimizes environmental impacts, protects financial resources, and nurtures a sense of place. That was something that came out of a lot of the conversations of how our campus feels. It feels like a small campus even though it's struck, strung out along the, the bottom of the, the bluff. How do we keep that feeling as we move forward? The, this defines building uses as the master plan laid them out with the core down here once well. The red is academic kinds of facilities. Um, the yellow is uh, housing. Orange is uh, a, a versatile set of buildings. One of the things that I've always been concerned about with master plans is they say, this building shall go here, and if you want to do anything different, you have to get a whole master plan approval change. I think it behooves us to say, we know where some things want to go because they make sense, but other areas we just say, you know, this is an area to build buildings, and when we get to that point, we'll decide what goes there. Automobile access. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out here is we are very tied to Austin Bluffs and North Nevada. And you may not know this is coming, but they're widening Austin Bluffs to six lanes starting next summer. And so we're going to have a lot of construction going on right by our campus, and it's going to be six lanes all the way across out to Academy. And so we'll be dealing with that construction. But one of the challenges for us is the shuttle bus system, and I want to talk about that for a second. Parking. We also took a look at parking. Um, the uh, darker circles are a three minute walking radius and the lighter colored circles are five minutes. So we started to take a look at where would parking structures go. And so potentially a parking structure down near the east end of the campus when we start to build that out. Parking structure and we're going to talk about one over by the Alpine Village area. And then uh, Potentially in the beginning, f surface lots down on North Nevada, that's the white areas, but potentially some of those might turn into parking structures as well. The internal shuttle. One of the things that's a challenge is with the shuttle system, they have to fight the traffic and the traffic lights as they come out on North Nevada and Austin, up Austin Bluffs. So we've designed taking Regent Circle as it serpentines through the campus, straightening out some pieces of it, bringing it around the current parking garage up towards the rec center, and then from roughly in that area down to North Nevada making it a shuttle only route. And so there would be no automobile traffic on it, just the shuttle and service and emergency vehicles. And that would go roughly from up in this area all the way down to the North Nevada area. And I think the idea on this one is kind of like the 16th Street Mall shuttle, if you think about that design in Denver, if you've been to that, where you have both pedestrians and shuttles that could access the campus without having to get onto the parkway. That's one of the concepts, but that's going to be, we're going to have to build that in phases because that's 
I think the first time we looked at it, it's probably a 20 or $30 million proposition to lay that out and do it. We've got a bridge we have to cross in Arroyo as well, so it be very expensive. Okay. Um, and and this, this would be the vehicular access, and then it's very, uh, we would parallel along some of it uh, with a pedestrian access, wrap the pedestrian access around our new parking garage, I'll talk about in a minute, and then bring it down through the buildings. And that would be the formal pedestrian spine, as you kind of see it flowing between and around Osborne Center. But potentially some trails that the informal paths that would drop off and walk and work their way around through there as well. And then when it gets down onto this, this would get to be more urban down here because we need to provide access to Eagle Rock, et cetera. All right. Oh, one other concept there. Uh, yeah, Let's back up. Is we talked about creating an express shuttle. So if you're using these parking centers down here, you could get on a parking shuttle and it would shoot right on up to the campus with no stops. And if it, as an internal route, it could make that route pretty quick and we could have some pretty good turnaround. So using parking down there wouldn't be quite the hassle it is today where, shoot, I just missed the shuttle, now I gotta stand here for 10 minutes. And then we would have a local stop route that would go around on the, the white spots. And so you could get on a local shuttle here if you were just headed up to one of these intermediate stops. And there's the pedestrian spine winding down through the campus, kind of taking and continuing it through. And we also are cognizant of the trails that surround us and connect to the city. And so we're taking a look at how trails could come through the north campus up along through here. This, this trail exists today, and how we would connect it through down to Monument Creek. And then we have trails on the bluff behind us as well. And there's a committee now taking a look at how these trails might be developed and maintained. Uh, open space. As you know, we don't have a lot of open space, but how could we preserve and create some open space so you can see the green areas on the campus? Uh, we're also proposing that a new entrance would be built down here, and the arrow wanted to go away in front. Uh, is it? Uh, you can tell we haven't practiced a whole lot. Uh, but we've talked about creating a new entrance in here with a boulevard type feel. And I'll expand on that in, the, in a minute as well. So trying to create some green spaces around on the campus. Stormwater, as we've talked about, uh, part of the master plan includes a complete utility study for electric, gas, water, sewer, and stormwater. So they've laid out how that should fit in with the facilities and the master plan and the arroyos, et cetera. So this is the east campus. So go down towards University Hall, which is all the way down here. And this was a concept master plan that was developed. It's been integrated into the master plan. And um, you can see um, Regent Circle wrapping around the outer edge, the pedestrian pond spine passing through the middle. Uh, some key pieces of this, the wooded area, we would try to preserve um, with smaller structures in the wooded area. If you can imagine coming off of campus and doing a nice walk down through a wooded area and then coming out into the more open area, with more institutional scale buildings. Um, when we did this, we were, had these sort of grand ideas of a grand stair leading down from the park, between the parking garage and the building down to University Hall and trying to make a stronger connection so University Hall doesn't feel so isolated. And that building down on the bar right there is was South Hall. It still sits on the state list, even though there's no state money for it. But this building right here. Yeah, that, that's where we would think about bookending the building with South Hall if and when the state ever finds capital construction funds for higher ed again. So this is the core campus. Um, and so uh, the University Center here, here's, uh, doesn't like black circle, right? This is Osborne Center, Main Hall, uh, uh, Craigmore. And there's parking along here for the moment but we're envisioning that a parking garage may be built here and we could start to take over some of this land for building. Um, a parking garage, another parking garage potentially over here. And um, yeah, I don't think it likes the black streets. And right now we're in the process of taking a look at designing a building for this location. In fact, we just presented this to the design review board this morning. This will be an office building to start with to take some of the crunch away 
from uh, the faculty, especially that are squeezed into some offices. We did a study, there's 89 faculty in doubling up in offices, and some of those offices are 90 <coughs> square feet. So two faculty in a 90 square foot office. Uh, so this building is uh, moving forward, it's been funded, and uh, we'll be, you'll see some activity there, probably not for about uh, nine months. Uh, then That's essentially the location of where the Small Business Development Center is, and we're going to relocate the SBDC and tear down that building, because that building was not meant to stay in our master plan, so we're going to knock that down and put a building in its spot. And then we move up um, to the rec center, which exists here now, and we funded uh, through the student fee increase. In addition to the rec center, we're basically going to double the size of the rec center. And uh, we'll be selecting the architect for that after the first of the year and moving into the design process for that. Um, and then this is Alpine Village. And uh, this is the parking garage that I've talked about. We're looking at 1,200 plus parking spaces fitting in here with a field on top. And it probably will not sit like this. It might sit more up in this area. But the general idea is there will be a parking garage. And it sits down in the arroyo. So it actually will not stick way up in the air. It'll fit into the arroyo. And since this is the head of the arroyo, most of the drainage goes down this other arroyo over this way. Only a small part of the drainage comes down through this spot so we can handle this location. And then this is showing um, some additional potential uh, residence halls. So when we talked about expanding to that 2,400 beds, uh, this is probably the first site that we would look at. This is where a parking lot exists, which is why we want to get the parking garage done first. And another point, Gary's pointing out, you probably know this is right now the parking lot for the rec center will also go away when the rec center gets expanded. So another reason why the parking garage needs to get going first. We're going to take out a lot of parking eventually over in the stand area. And we're on a very fast track for that parking garage. We're going to have it done 14 months from now. And we just started design today. So wish me luck. <laughs> um, then you can see up here that what I call the Mesa area. Um, these are this group of buildings that sit down and flow down along the edge here, avoiding the arroyo on both sides. And the idea is, is that this is just sort of a placeholder for future buildings. But if we do put the road in, that you can see the, the spine here, the, and the pedestrian spine, and we put utilities in, we want to put them in the right place so that when we do put these buildings in, they'll fit right in. Okay. All right, um, so that shows the Mesa a little bit more. We just talked about that. And then uh, we talk about the health and wellness campus. Um, I marked on here the Lane Center. Uh, which is under construction right now. If you've driven on North Nevada, you see the intersections being done and we're moving utilities and getting ready for the Lane Center. That's a building that's going to house some university uh, functions as well as Peak Vista, which is a local nonprofit health provider. In this case, they're going to focus on seniors and we're going to be housing U UCCS programs, the CU Aging Center, Gerontology Center, Wellness Group, nursing programs in there as well. This is um, this wellness village is kind of this area here. And what's really cool, this is a, a bluff that sticks up there. So it'd be a different kind of quad because it would have this ponderosa pine lace uh, bluff that would go here. So the lane center sits here. We're actually thinking about how building, what we call building two would look here. But essentially as we grow potentially the branch medical campus, the nursing school, all the things we're trying to do in the health sciences field, you could one day see this, we see it, in the master plan as the place where the health and wellness would be done for the entire campus. This would be the health and wellness village or quad, whatever you want to call it. This right now, the Orient View is where the trailers and Eagle Rock are right now. This is where the ROTC is right now. So but there's a really nice bluff here we're trying to take advantage of and keep them away from this arroyo that runs right through here. It's, it's, it's part of that acknowledging the responsible capacity of the land. That's all parking in the white over there. Right, so the Visual and Performing Arts Center. Uh, this shows the boulevard that uh, we talked about, which is this, you know, this thing that works. Boulevard's right here. 
Yeah, so that is right across from the main entrance into the University Village, Colorado. And then the building just to the north of that, and then the next building up, thank you, Vana, yeah. um, <laughs> is the, uh, the Performing Arts and the Visual Arts Center. And so this is where we would try to consolidate all the visual and performing arts. Right now, they are literally scattered from one end of the campus to the other. You have music down in University Hall. You have a, a fine arts group down in a modular. We've got set construction for theater down in TRW building. There's pieces in Dwyer. There's pieces in, so they're everywhere. So this is the opportunity to eventually pull them all together. Whether we build all this at one time, is a question, but the idea is this is the site where we would put it. I would point out that as you look at this, what is happening is we are developing our community edge here. The things that we're putting along this North Nevada edge are the community edge, so see, community will be coming to Peak Vista in our Lane Center. They will want to come to performances in the performing arts. And as we go north, we're going to talk about the arena building, 4,000 seat arena that would also be a community amenity. So we're, we're looking at this edge as being our community edge. And the other idea is with the restaurants here and the underpass right here, this is the natural place for the Performing Arts Center. Fortunately, it's right in the parking lot of Four Diamonds because here's the current Mount Lion soccer stadium. holding on to that now. But this is where it belongs. We master plan this campus. We think about people going for having a bite to eat and then coming over to a performance of theater works. This is what was the grand vision when the region loaned the money to make the other pass happen as part of the urban project. And you'll see also this sits right on top of a mountain lion field, our women's softball field. So we would have to move that as well, which you'll see in the next slide. There we go. So we're calling this the athletic area. We have no flat land on the campus, but the flattest land that comes close to it is up at the north end of our campus. And so you can see um, we're talking about a, an arena, a 4,000 seat arena. And the reason we picked roughly that size, it was one Steve Kirkham felt he could fill up with his dynamic basketball teams and volleyball teams. But more importantly, it kind of fits between the 2,000 seat Civic Center and the 6,000 plus 8,000 seat um, world Arena, so we would fit our venue in to meet the needs of the community in, in that size. Um, off to the, to the uh, right side of that is a potential natatorium addition, if we wanted to add a natatorium. You can see the parking lot. We have already built, working with the city, the little J-turn up at the top, and the entrance into the parking lot's already been cut, so we've looked forward to that. Um, having a, uh, a soccer and track field, and uh, making that in the community amenity as well. And then off to the side, um, the baseball diamonds would be replaced. And way down in the corner, kind of covered up by the, the words there, there's a little thing sticking out. That we saw as an open field to start with and potentially could be covered over eventually and made a big field house inside, where during inclement weather you could go in and play football or soccer or whatever. So um, that takes us kind of walking through the campus. Sustainability is also a very important part of the master plan. Um, we've adopted as part of the sustainability process uh, elite gold buildings, but from an energy standpoint, uh, the new academic office building I talked about, we're aiming for a 40% reduction over a standard building. So pretty aggressive there. Um, and you know, Linda's here, she could talk a lot of this, but. Uh, the university is uh, in part of the American College University's climate commitment. Uh, Linda and her team have created the sustainability or climate action plan. And so all of that is integrated in, is part of the master plan and adopted so that we're sure that not only these plans would sit on their own, but are also uh, integrated into the master plan process as well. Um, you know, smart growth, we talked about how can we use our classrooms more fully, even though we are using them uh, fairly fully now. Being responsible to the capacity of the land. And I just want to back up to them now. Okay. The, the associate deans, I have to call out, we've had a good fall where we've actually felt it in shuttles on Fridays, where we had to add shuttles on Fridays. We've added so many classes to Fridays. By using our parking lots on Fridays, 
not just Monday through Thursday, we forestall the need to add more parking. We forestall the need to add more classrooms. So I just want to call out the associate deans. I think they exceeded our expectations for the first year. We continue to have those discussions with the associate deans who do class scheduling with faculty. We pushed a lot of sections to Fridays this year. You're probably seeing it in the parking lots on Fridays. So I just wanted to call that out that increasing classroom utilization using our parking lots on Fridays is a sustainability thing because we don't have to add and build and take down more land for surface parking. <coughs> So this kind of summarizes the, the master plan. Um, 20 to 23,000 students staying within the CCAT guidelines could go above that if we exceeded that. Um, academic and research space, roughly 2 million gross square feet. Athletic and refre recreation, I don't need to read all the numbers there, but it gives you a rough idea, and this is in the master plan. You can access this on our website, the facilities website. There's a nice little icon in the lower edge, and click on that. It's labeled penultimate draft, right, because it's not officially approved yet. Um, hopefully after December 1st, I can take penultimate draft off to that and it'll be our master plan. We are, we're accommodating parking. Uh, you know, not all that parking gets added right away, but you know, over time. And so you can see the totals down there at the bottom, you know, 5.6 uh, million gross square feet in all, uh, potentially being added as this plan envisions it. So that was a real <coughs> quick review. So questions? Happy to answer questions or thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. I'll think pie in the sky. Any chance um, with additional parking? You get reserved parking for staff and faculty? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not um, touching that. Where's our chief of police when we need it? That would be hard to do. There's some campuses that do that, but that would, it would take a lot of parking. Five or six years since we've raised parking rates because of what's been going on economically for our employees, we're going to have to look at it down the road. It's not next year, but the only way that parking well, there is no state dollars in that parking garage we're about to build, so we have to finance it. The one we have built has 23-year mortgage left on it. There's another one coming. It, 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 it's there's an art to this, but since 1968, the state has not built parking lots for four-year institutions, so we've had to pay them all. We all get to pay for them, including our students. One that's of why our we're sensitive about parking rates, and we, that's why we kept them constant for the last at least five years. I think was our last rating. And one of the things we discussed in the master plan: you start out with surface lots, which cost four thousand dollars a space to build. Then, as you can, the enrollment increases and student and faculty and staff increases, you can now spread costs of a parking system across more people. So then you can add a garage finally. And then as you grow some more, then you finally can add the next garage. So it's kind of a bootstrap thing in terms of how you, you, you work your way into garage. And that's where we're at. We've gone, when I came here five years ago, a little over 8,000. Now we're a little under 10. And we can work this new garage in with modest rate changes. Other questions? Ron? Uh, this uh, Performing Arts Center, uh, does that mean that theater works is going to be Transported over there. That would be one of the ideas, for sure. Yeah. Well, the subsequent question then: uh, Is there any uh, long-term ideas of how to use uh, University Hall at that point? It's a great question. It never was really a great uh, classroom-friendly type building. That's a really good question. Actually, the chancellor, we've had discussions about potentially maybe moving some of our back office things that don't need to be on the heart of the campus, like. Um, finance and budget game, and I've had this conversation, maybe surprising to your staff, but down the road, <laughs> as we, uh, down the road as, we, as we think about moving theater works down there or, and, and other things, because not, it's not just theater works down there, it's, it's our, our visual artists is down there as well. When they got from Columbine, we put them down there when we got mechanical and aerospace engineering in the Osborne Center. So it's not just theater works, it's the other arts that are there as well. But potentially, maybe that building would be better suited for HR, maybe better suited for um, resource management, 
and less of the more and more interactive because we're going to have to grow financial aid staff we're going to have to grow student success staff where are we going to put all those guys maybe they're going to take up more of Cragmore than they are today and we'll move some folks down there so that is part of the chessboard run and doing the master plan but i promise you we don't let much space go unutilized around here we're still using old cottages that came with the sanitarium in 1965 for storage for theater works headquarters that kind of thing there's a place to store something or put somebody, I promise you, we'll put it to work. For sure. <laughs> As you know, because you used to be in the building we're about to tear down. <laughs> right? yeah, I have five offices. Uh, throughout there you the go. <laughs> You're a new living example of moving around. <laughs> Russ, would, would the City Color Springs and the Color Springs Christian uh, School still be involved in using any of the facilities as they develop in this plan? We'll talk with them about it. The lease is up on Fort Islands in January 2014. Um, we won't, we've already told them they won't be a long-term extension, but there could be one year depending on our timing. The Christian School, if you can believe it, we're in year seven of a 10-year agreement on Mountain Lion Stadium. I cannot believe we're in year seven. They paid for the labor to put in that turf, and that was how they got a 10-year deal to play their own soccer and softball, their football games there. So we will be discussing that with the Christian School. I think it's in our best interest to be good community partners. We can do more together than we can do by ourselves, even as we get bigger. So I don't see us changing. And actually, the athletic department, Steve Kirkham's staff, they do a great job of managing that relationship with the Christian School. And I think it brings us a lot of students. You've got La Hanta, Salida, Buena Vista. All these schools that feed us students are coming here and playing sports. It's awesome. Yes? I'm um, speaking of the community, what are the estimated For, in terms of bodies or economic so impact? Economic. Okay. Fair. I'm, I'm always skeptical of those big multipliers. Maybe it's my undergraduate degree in economics. So I was a little skeptical of that. But clearly, with a $171 million budget this year, and us by next summer having $85 million in construction underway, that's in the two $250 million range. I, I think there's easily a two multiplier that we're $350 million of economic impact right now. Community would like this to be 500 million to a billion dollars worth of economic impact, and I think that'll happen as we continue to grow. So I would say it's all upside as we add students, add staff and faculty to help take care of those students, add to our research base that we're doing now, um, continue to grow. We will be a big economic factor, bigger than 350 million, which is our kind of our, our assumption today is around 350 million. So not small potatoes for the city of Colorado Springs. So you said the city, the city would like us to be. Well, they, they'd like us to be as big as Boulder tomorrow. Chancellor can attest to that. They'd like us, they'd like us to be 30,000 students by tomorrow, you know, because... What are, they, about, what are they doing to help that process? Well, they've done a lot. Uh, this frontage road was on the master plan. Well, it's now part of us. The, the, I will, one example that I can give you is that roundabout in front of Main Hall and that frontage road down to the University Hall, we didn't pay a dime for it, any of it. That was $4 million of RTA project was part of the union overpass. The city made that happen because they were going to cut off our nursing school. And we were going to have to have everybody driving through the neighborhoods, which we knew was not going to work. So there's there's one example. Two, the power lines buried. Have you never noticed that the power lines drop at, at uh, La Casita and pop back up at Harley Davidson? The city paid a million dollars. The city utilities organization matched that million dollars. That was a two million dollar undergrounding project. And not only did it clean up our aesthetics, but it narrowed the easements for where we can actually build those buildings you just saw because we were prevented. We had a 75 foot easement where we couldn't put any buildings within 37 and a half feet of either side of the power line. So we narrowed those easements. We took out those ugly power lines. And, I, and so there's, that's two examples I can think of. They've done a number of things for us. Another one, we've given them some land to TRW for a sanding station down on the back of the corn. Now those will be hoping for a snow day. This won't be good news for you. <laughs> There's now a city sanding station one mile from the campus, and they've promised that Nevada and Austin Bluffs will get higher priority of sanding and treatment when we see our next snowstorm. And so those are things, yes, the city in tangible ways when they can, they've been stressed financially. They're trying to help the university grow. Other questions? Yes, are, are there still plans for a trolley system from downtown up to campus? Yes. It, it just needs money. <laughs> it needs a lot of money. It's, uh, 
you know, actually, we, we talked about it, that we could pull that in. You notice that none of those buildings are right on top of Nevada, including the Lane Center. Um, Gary goes back. If, if they somehow find the money, they, we could pull the trolley right up there. And so we, we purposely pulled the buildings back as a commitment to the trolley project. Uh, it's, it's someone's going to have to come up with a funding source. I mean, candidly, you know, the city does have a limited public transit system that they're struggling to support with 10% of the PPRTA money. The trolley system is very, very expensive. I mean, they're working on the cars, but that's not what it costs. It's the laying the tracks and it's maintaining and operating it. So, yes, we can accommodate the trolley system if some folks downtown can figure out how to bring it our way. How's that? Because I think it'd be cool. If we could get that done, have a trolley to downtown from the campus. So we made this happen, made this work so that that could happen. Okay? Matt? Um, where exactly is the money going to come from? Said <laughs> <laughs> our new budget analyst. <laughs> That's a great question because the state doesn't have a lot of money. So a lot of these aren't funded. Some of them aren't funded. Um, this is coming from the students doubling their rec center fee. They voted for it. This is coming from more people parking on campus, maybe slightly higher rates, and a piece of the rec center fee is going to put that field in. By the way, there'll be nets here so you guys won't be dodging soccer balls or football balls. <laughs> <laughs> the Lane Center, we're building with no state money. We took some lease money because we're bringing the aging center over from Golf Acres. And we did philanthropy. The chancellor and her team were very good at raising $4 million from a, one of our alums. And we, we literally worked hard to find how to finance that one. I will tell you candidly, this act, this, uh, where's our office building? Right, right here. That office building is coming right out of tuition revenue extra tuition revenues from additional students being here. So we have to, there's not one fund source. The remodels you're seeing in here, in, in Clyde's and in um, Burger Hall will be under remodel for the next two months. And the work we did in Cafe 65 is a whole different fund source. That's coming from the reserves and the revenues of the auxiliaries that are here run at the student center. So when you don't have a lot of money, you get very creative. And that's why we partner with folks like at the Christian School we wouldn't have that soccer stadium near as nice as it is. Um, we wouldn't have Mount Lion Stadium if it wasn't for partnering with the Christian school. So we, it, it forces us to be more entrepreneurial and to look for partners who can help us get things done. And the same with the new athletic facilities? Yeah, this one's a big nut to crack. I mean, these are, you know, a 4,000 seat arena is probably $90 million. So that's not a small number. And that's not the natatorium. I mean, that's, that's a big project. Up here. But we've got to get it laid out and start thinking about it. We never know when someone might take a shine to us and say, here's here's 100 million, let's go do this together. Uh, we'll be ready. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Sort of on a follow-up, is there any kind of, you know, you get the, uh, what, the center in uh, Coors Field or whatever, is there any kind of sponsorship idea and there mm -hmm. will be something like that? Sure. We, we need to look at our beverage contracts. It's on our list to work on. You know, what if we did an exclusive with Coke or Pepsi as we grow? We've seen other schools do that, like Sacramento State did that to help get an arena built. So we've got that going with Ent now, and that's bringing financial benefits to us with our partnership with Ent. Our, our exclusive with Sodexo brings financial benefits to the campus. So absolutely right. Those are the kinds of things colleges and universities are having to do is think more entrepreneurial. So that's on the list. Yes. Other questions? Tracy? Just a quick question. The area between uh, Main Hall and Cragmore yes. and University Hall, do we own all of that now, or are there still pockets that are privately owned? There's still pockets that are privately owned. Yes, so we own all but about two houses on this side of the street, and we own all but about three houses on this side of the street, and one of them is owned by one of our employees. Yeah. We just got one from a woman who passed away, um, donated her uh, property to us. But down here is where we're going to put that greenhouse. Um, the greenhouse to add organic food to our menus. The greenhouse is going down here, and that construction started. started. It's already started. That's great. So and that's also part of the Sodexo. That money to build the greenhouse came from our partnership with Sodexo, providing food service here on campus. There's an example of that's not coming out of tuition. That's not coming out of anything the other pocket. That's coming out of that one. So that's how we get those things done. Tracy. Secondary question. How much impact do you think the construction in front of campus is going to have next year with trying to get students up here from Nevada in time for classes? Are we going to be routing down Mountview through the neighborhood? Or We've just begun to 
discussions with the city. They haven't okay. even picked the contractor or architect yet. Oh. What we will do is press for two lanes of traffic open in both directions. We've talked about them doing a lot of this at night, like after 7, after 7.30, 7.30 to 6 in the morning. We did that with Centennial Hall. I'm, no, seriously, the, they would keep two lanes going in each direction during the work day. We, we, we're very concerned about it. And trust me, it'll be part of our discussion. We're going to be trading land with them. They're going to give us some land that they don't need. There's some land that they need to make the, the widening work. That trade gives us the ability to talk schedule and how we're going to get this done to minimize the impact to the academic mission of this campus. There are also, besides the two lanes, they've agreed to work to keep a left turn lane as well. Right. So there'd be two lanes and a left turn lane. <laughs> so what you need to know is that's from here. From, here's the Christian school from Mallow basically, to Meadow. Basically to the Union Bridge, where it yeah. takes up the three lanes coming up. To Rainier. It'll be six lanes all the way across. When does that start? Well, we haven't got an exact date. They said they would start talking next summer. Do you know if there's any plans to change the route into the FEC with this expansion? You know, we did have a plan at one time. It's really expensive. We have we own this land next to it. The grade is so steep here. We have the ability to make this a left end, but we'd have to take the road, Jamie, all the way over and back on our property to do it. And we have to take out a number of big ponderosa pines that are there. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not in the cards right now. It could be done. Right now, there's no economic reason to it other than, and I get as a parent at the FTC making that double U turn is not. Well, we were just laughing about what the, the traffic potentially that it'll be even harder to get in there. Yeah, well, Maybe. we're going to work on, you know, if you think about it, when we did the overpass here at Austin Bluffs and Union, I think we all feared a really bad time with that. And actually, they did, a, I would suggest to you, a pretty fair job of keeping traffic going when this project was going. No question, this one's in our front door and it'll be more challenging. But it will be a challenge. Linda. Uh, well, I love the internal route in terms of the shuttle. Uh, it's really amazing. What I'm, I'm curious about, so lately with that growth, we've been adding another shuttle bus per year. So in terms of just the carbon footprint of that, what are some things that we might be thinking of in the long term um, to not just add another shuttle bus each year, but Well, I think Jim's working on that. We've talked about it. It's, it's economics, too. It, it, you know, the biodiesel is an issue. With the supplier of biodiesel is an issue with those buses. It's a challenge, Linda, because Martin does have this notion, a chance I can tell you, we'll wrap up with this, that we need a nice little gondola that floats from here up to here. And that would be very sustainable and be cool. I don't know if everyone would like the aesthetics of it, and I'm pretty sure we can't afford the economics of it. But, that doesn't mean we're not looking at what are our options. Okay. But there's okay. another obvious, if we do scheduling with some of the additional facilities with the three to five minute blocks, in, right. and that's one of the things. For example, having visual farming arts strung all over the campus means that their students cannot, cannot not use either walking or some form of training. One of the real keys is getting this health and wellness zone. That will negate the amount of usage on a given day of a large number of people. And so part of it, as strange as it may seem, is the more of the facilities that we can actually get the logical configuration will reduce the need for showing people around. Then there are, of course, shuttles with reduced kinds of carbon impact, electronic, other kinds of vehicles. That's what the and gym is, is talking about. But I can see a huge benefit from visual cameras and the health and wellness stuff that we don't have today. The challenge of the gym. reduce our carbon footprint with the aging center and the stuff that we have over in the community that we have students coming in and out just when we open the I think the challenge could be look at electric buses for this shuttle. Yes. Here the challenge is 7% grade. So can we make a 5% grade work? Because shuttle buses in the snow on a 7% grade probably aren't going to make it up the hill for us. Because of problems. 
I want to thank everybody for their interest in this. And like you said, this will be up. It's be up on the website, and I hope it can be approved by CCHE. Thanks for spending an hour with me.